and wel welcome. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event, raising children uh, in in um, uh, raising children in a multilingual world. I'm uh, my name is Professor John Hadjik. I'm from the University of Melbourne, and I'm delighted to be here uh, this evening. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the benefits of being multilingual or bilingual and how you can encourage bilingualism, multilingualism in your family. So uh, the first thing is, how many languages do you speak? And uh, some people, when I ask this question, some people say they speak two languages, other people say they speak three languages, uh, some people speak even more languages. In fact, it's quite normal in many parts of the world to speak more than two or three languages. Uh, there's nothing unusual about it at all. So, why why would you be bilingual? Well, in many parts of the world, uh, there are people sp uh, there are people from different groups speaking different languages, uh, who uh, speaking different languages who come together, live together, and that's certainly the case in the Australian context where we have millions of people who've come from all around the world with their own cultures and languages who've settled in Australia and would like to share their cultural and linguistic heritage with their children. And what I'd like to tell you tonight is that it's entirely possible to do so. You just have to know uh, how you achieve that goal. Uh, and it's entirely your right to pass on to your children your linguistic um, heritage. And of course, um, it's what you need to know is more than 20% of Australians speak a language other than English at home. Uh, it's natural that you want to speak your first language to your child. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Of course, there's shared culture and heritage. And more importantly, it's a wonderful gift from one generation uh, to the next. But also, as you give them this gift, it's not just about passing on your family history and tradition and culture. You're also doing um, your ch own children some wonderful things. The long-term benefits of being bilingual, multilingual are very well known. We know, for instance, that bilingualism is good for your child's brain. We know it's very good for the family. Uh, it supports communication and st strengthens bonds between all family members, and that's really important. Not only do the children uh, need to and want to communicate with their parents and vice versa, it's also important to be able to maintain communication between grandparents and grandchildren and other parts of the family as well. But we do know it's really good for the brain and the benefits for the brain last a lifetime. Sometimes people ha have a negative attitude towards um, bilingualism. You know, will it hurt my children? I've heard it's going to do bad things to my children. Um, and there are, um, I can answer this very easily. No, it doesn't cause any harm to your children. You're certainly not doing any harm to them and you're more likely to be doing them some um, really positive things. So for instance, does it cause language delay? No, that is unrelated. Uh, so for instance, I have a friend who's a very su successful psychiatrist. He was brought up in an English only family. English was the only language ever in his environment. He didn't speak until he was five years old. That's just the nature of that child. He went on very successful schooling, went on to university, completed medical qualification. The argument in that case would be is that speaking only English is um, causes problems for your child. That's not an argument I would like to make. It's because every child is different. Bilingualism, does it cause stuttering? No, it's completely, stuttering is a phenomenon that has got nothing to do with how many languages a child speaks. Is it confusing for children? It mixes them up. No, children are actually very savvy. Uh, they know very quickly the difference between different languages. If they do mix a language, it's because they're using their available language skills to fill gaps or also to show you uh, that they know a thing or two about language. And remember, it's the kind of thing that you well do. You might well do as an adult. You might be speaking your language and throwing in some English as well. That's quite common, language mixing in adults. If you're doing it, your child is likely to, uh, to do that as well. It's no surprise. But often they might also do it for play, uh, make fun. So remember, you, you, kids are very clever. They can cope with more than one language. It's, not a, it's really not a, a, a long-term issue. All right, what about when children go to school? Well, 
the first thing is that the expectation is that children go to preschool or kindergarten now. That provides them with a very strong basis for access to English. One thing we should not underestimate is how common English is around us. English is everywhere. Your child, when you take your small child out in the street to the supermarkets, they, uh, they very quickly realize how much English there is in the world. It's on the radio, it's on television, etc. They already have a lot of contact with English. And, but we do know that uh, the bilinguals do better over time in English. So the benefits you know, all the way up to year 12, so long as you raise a, a child in a positive environment, with positive expectations towards education, and you throw in extra language, they'll do very, very, very well when it gets to VCE. If a child is having school problems at school, this is typically not related uh, to language. There may be other factors at play. However, uh, often at school, it's an easy, easy element to pick out because it's um, easily identifiable. But there are often, usually other factors at play. What we do know, and I repeat this, positive families supporting positive school outcomes result in positive uh, results for your children. And that's really important. So the real story is that learning languages is very natural for your children and that children are actually very capable of distinguishing languages at a very early age. In fact, we know that even within the womb that they can tell the difference between languages. And my own youngest child, I can remember very, very young, was able to watch SBS television and say, this is this language, this is that language. So your children are very, very attuned to uh, language difference. Sometimes they'll go through a period of transference where they may use elements of one language in the other. That's okay. Children, uh, regardless of how many languages they learn, go through a process of learning how to master a language. So a child who only speaks English, for instance, many parents note that when they start speaking English, their English is excellent, and then, then all of a sudden their English has got worse, and then, all, then their English will eventually improve. There's a very simple explanation for this. When children first learn to use language, what they tend to do is just memorize. And what they memorize is what they've heard, and it's correct. Then what they start doing is they start playing with the structure, and they start playing with the rules, but they have to work them out for themselves. So regardless of whether they have one language or two language, they are using the evidence in front of them to try and work out what the rules are. They make lots of mistakes. That's absolutely normal because we make lots of mistakes when we speak English or our languages. It's completely normal. Uh, we, we take lots of, uh, we, we play around with things. So for instance, the verb to bring. In English, when I say today I bring an apple with me, but when I turn it in the past, I say yesterday I, well, in Australian English, you'll find five, four or five different ways of saying uh, the past tense of bring. Yesterday I brought the apple, yesterday I brung the apple, yesterday I brang the apple, and increasingly today people are saying yesterday I bought the apple. Uh, and I heard that on ABC radio yesterday, using bought as the past tense of bring. Now a child may say yesterday I bringed the apple, and that's completely reasonable hypothesis for your child because they know that many verbs, you just add an ed at the end. The issue for the child is to work out which verbs do or do not have that particular structure. So it's a bit of trial and error. And our job as we're raising our children is to assist them, facilitate the process in a positive way. Remember, it's very important to be positive. So language mixing, when it's done, is often done consciously as well, maybe done for fun. It's not a negative. And what we do know is that bilinguals do better on IQ tests and they do better on things like empathy. They try and understand other people better. So even small children who have a second language have been shown in scientific experiments to be more empathetic to the needs and wishes of others. It's really quite, quite interesting results. Now, what happens if someone criticizes a parent for teaching their child their language? And unfortunately, uh, while this attitude used to be much more common in the past, you may find this happening to you. So a family member says, oh, please, you know, don't teach our language to your child. You don't want to muddle them up or whatever. 
it's really important that you be ready to answer that type of um, issue and that you have your reasons ready and explain them. So for instance, uh, you know, and there are lots of different reasons that you might have ready, uh, but for instance, an obvious one might be, well, it's important that my child speaks my language because I want that child to communicate with me and my, my parents, the grandparents, in my language. It's really important to me. And this is exactly what happened within my own family. My, my, my mother was determined that the grandchildren spoke her language. She speaks a tiny little language which has very few speakers, but she was absolutely determined that, that she would speak to them in Slovenian and that they would speak, um, that they would be able to understand her and speak back in Slovenian. That's all. It's not because she wanted them to be rocket scientists. It's not because she wanted to expand their brain. It's not because um, she wanted them to do better at school, which is all entirely possible and they've done well at school. And I'd like to think that that having this exposure has helped that. It's because uh, in our family, speaking, uh, speaking the grandparents' language is highly valued and considered to be important. It's about sharing, sharing what we have and passing it down with generations. Now, is it easier for some children uh, to learn languages than others? Yes, every child is different. That's completely normal. You cannot, you cannot expect, if you have more than one child, you cannot expect the other child to do the same things at the same speed, etc. Every child is different. What we know is that girls tend to develop bilingually a little bit faster than boys, but boys actually um, catch up pretty quickly. So, when do you start? Straight away, from the very first day. Please don't delay. It's really important that you start as soon as you can. Children, the younger they are, they are sponges. You don't, they didn't have to think about language to absorb language. Uh, they catch language rather than get taught language. So it's caught rather than taught. So the sooner the better. And we also know that the younger they, they are, the pronunciation is better as well. So when should you speak your language to your child? Uh, whenever you can, certainly at home and anywhere else, whenever is possible. Be consistent, that's really important. So if you're in a mixed marriage, if you speak your language and your partner only speaks English, then a really effective strategy is to say, okay, I'm gonna speak my language to the child and my partner will speak English. So that's, that's a way of doing it. And make sure that your family members, etc., support you. They also have an important role and explain to them the reasons why you'd like them to, to use this language. You may use it in specific places. So if you go to play group outside of the home, or you go visiting family, or you go to shops where your language is spoken, etc. Please use your language. Consistency is really, really important. The other really critical uh, element of passing your language on to your children is that it should be enjoyable and fun. It should be a positive experience. Young children learn through playing, through fun. We know this now, it's taken us a long time to understand this, but exploring, playing, uh, trying things out, but having fun, having a positive experience are all uh, uh, are the basis of how young children learn about everything in the world. So it's really, really important that it be a positive experience for your children. Don't correct your children. Don't be negative about them, about what they say. Remember, they are learning, they are mastering. It takes time just as it was exactly the same for you as you learn to speak your language. So these are the simple tips. Be consistent, be positive, be patient. Show appreciation and encouragement for your child's efforts and give praise often. But importantly, have fun. This is a really, really fun thing to do. It's a really positive thing to do. Okay, so some strategies. Speak clearly, make sure you give examples, repeat yourself and ask questions, and reuse your child's words. Okay, that's really important. Make sure you actively engage with your child in family language. Okay, so if, your if the only things that you say to your child are in your language are, uh, please use a fork, please wash your hands before uh, breakfast, then that's 
going to be the only things that your child is going to be able to say. Your child needs lots of rich language about everything. They need to be able to expand their vocabulary. They need to hear words being used about different things. It's really important. So make sure that the language you use is varied, it's rich, and it's right for the age of your child. Okay, obviously, you can't talk about uh, nuclear thermodynamics to a two-year-old. Now you should wait a little until they've gotten to high school. All right, so what does rich mean? Rich means providing them with lots of words because they're the bricks that build the house. And it's really important that you give them lots of words. But you have to test them out. You have to explain them to the child. You have to give them lots of opportunities to hear the words, to use the words, to understand the words. So it's really important uh, to engage. And remember, repetition is really important as well. You can't be expected to master something by having heard it only once, which is why I'm going to repeat to you that teaching your language to your child has to be enjoyable and fun and positive. Okay, that's really, really important. I can't emphasize that enough. Okay, so remember, every child is different and a child, one child may need more language input and time than others. That's completely normal. One really helpful strategy is to introduce your child in your language through reading. Okay, reading is really important. It's a bonding experience. It's something that a parent can share with, uh, share with a child. Uh, and, you know, we all know that children like it. When, when parents read to them, and we've all been through that, where we've read the same book 300 times. It's a very good way to build vocabulary. And it's not just about books. It's about books and stories and songs. And these can also lead to ideas about play, because remember, children learn through play. And of course, the best thing about all of these things is they can be used over and over again. So why does reading help a child? And remember, I'm using reading in a sort of a big ticket way. Uh, it's because it introduces new ideas and things to talk about. It takes you out of the, takes you out of the house. And that's really important. It's a way of expanding a, a child's experience of the world. In a, in a way that's not possible inside the family home. And it means that you're able to use new words that a child might not otherwise hear or have access to, as well as new structures. But it's really important to, to be able to show your child that you've taken your, uh, your language, your family language, outside of the family home and that, that you want that you want them to experience what happens outside the, in the bigger picture, the bigger world. That's really important. And it allows your child, it gives the, your child that experience and the ability to think and talk about the bigger picture, the wider world. That's really important uh, that your child knows. So that your child, for instance, knows what the word is in your language for elephant. Your child knows what the word is for volcano. Your child knows what the word is for snow, for instance. All of those sorts of things that you wouldn't ordinarily um, have an opportunity to talk about in your family, uh, in the family context. So that's really, really um, important thing to do. I, I really can't emphasize enough the benefit of reading to your child and that really personal uh, bonding experience that you're able to have with your child. So that's that's really important as well. Now, when I talk about reading, I've come back to this, it's not just about words on a book. That is that is certainly uh, important. And exposing your child to words on a uh, writing on paper or wherever it is, is a good thing. And that's actually going to be helpful to them when they go to school and they're learning English because you're getting them used to the idea of reading, okay? And the experience of reading is a really transferable skill. Uh, and they will do a lot of reading at school, primarily in English, but it's something that you can easily do at home. It's not at all, um, not at all a problem. So uh, just think about 
think about that. So, you know, there, and there, there are ways I'll talk about where you can get access to reading materials, etc. But there are, um, there are other things you can do. Singing songs, they have the, the, the repetition of singing songs. It helps with uh, pronunciation. There's a lot of rhyme. There are little stories in songs as well. Uh, they're very helpful as well. Children in, enjoy those. And of course, stories that you can tell without looking at books, etc. Traditional stories, folk tales, etc. All of those sorts of things are, are very important to children. They're all part of the imagination, the fantasy that a child develops uh, as part of their experience of the world. And you really are, through that, doing some really wonderful things with your child. And of course, um, as I said, the, when looking at a book and looking at words on a page, now it, you may get the impression that your child is initially reading. They seem to, you know, you show them the page and they seem to be reading. What they're typically doing is they're memorizing and they're, re they're repeating back. And you'll know that yourself, those of you who've had that experience, is when you decide, well, I'm bored with, I've read this this story 300 times, they're going to change the words, and they'll say to you, no, 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 that's not what it says, okay? Uh, they will eventually develop uh, appropriate uh, uh, reading skills, but remember they're relying initially on a lot of memory, but that's really good because the, the memory work is really important, that the ability then to, to come up with ideas about language based on memory is really important. And again, it's getting them used to the idea of reading in English. It's, it's really important. Now, you can read without words. It's very simple. And sometimes you may belong to a community where books aren't widely available. Uh, and that's not a problem. Uh, what you need are some images. Uh, you may, for instance, have a picture of a cat and a bird next to a flower. Well, that simple image, those are three objects cat, a smiling cat, a bird flying above the flower that's next to the cat. All of that provides you with rich opportunity to read to the child and talk to the child about what they can see on the picture. So for instance, you can have a look at the, the bird and you can say, what color is the bird's wings? Uh, what do you think about the bird's beak? What do you call that thing? Uh, uh, on, uh, on the cat's face, those little hairs on the cat's face. What do you call a cat's hand or, or foot? So, you know, those are the sorts of things. So it's very easy to be able to teach a child very simple concepts and words in your language. And you can ask them about, well, do you like cats? What, what color cat do you like? So, uh, and what about flowers? What flower do you think this looks like? And what color is the flower? Do you think the flower is red or yellow or pink? Or do you think it's got multiple colors? So you can see that with even with, with very simple tools, it's actually possible to give your child a really rich experience and to encourage them to use the language in ways perhaps you hadn't necessarily thought of. So these are really simple strategies that we know are very effective. Okay, so what happens if your partner doesn't speak your language? That's, that's okay, that's quite common. Lots of people in Australia come, uh, come from mixed families. Uh, so if your partner may only speak English, that's absolutely fine. Your partner and their family can provide positive support and that's really important. It's about the positive support and the patience. You need to explain to your partner and sometimes you may need to explain to the partner's family the reasons why you'd like your child to learn your language and to, um, to uh, draw benefits from learning, learning your language. And remember, there's absolutely nothing to stop your partner or your partner's family from learning your language. There's lots of books available, lots of adult courses, etc. So in the case of my family, uh, uh, my uh, my children's mother didn't speak um, my my languages, and uh, but we decided my family to use Slovenian, my mother's language. I come from a mixed language family, so we were raised speaking multiple languages. But we decided with the children to speak Slovenian, 
uh, because uh, for family reasons, very specific personal reasons we decided. And uh, in that case, the children's mother, uh, uh, their mother uh, actually developed very good proficiency uh, in, in, uh, in that particular language because they get to draw the benefit as, as well. So they get at least passive ability. They don't necessarily have to speak the language, but they also get a benefit from it as well. So that, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing uh, for other people as well. Okay, now what happens when your child doesn't want to speak your language? That's completely normal. Please don't panic. And the trick is you just have to be super patient. Please don't panic at all. It's absolutely, completely normal. It's a very common problem. Uh, in fact, I'd be surprised if there was anyone in Australia who didn't have this issue at some point. What happens typically, what happens very often is your children work out very quickly that English is the language of power. It's the one that's most widely spoken in this country. They, under, they understand that so that when you're speaking English to your partner or speaking English to your friends or when you go to the shops, etc., they understand the importance of English. They really do. We're very privileged by the power of English. Typically, when they go to school and they start using English with all of their schoolmates, that's typically a critical moment. Now, children, when they're at school, they just want to be like the other kids and the other kids speak English to them. And if that's the case, they want to speak English, all right? And lots of the other kids only speak English. So they want to be like the other kids, many of whom only speak English. So it becomes a challenge. I completely understand that. So what you need to do is just take the long view, all right? Just be patient. Speak to your child. Insist in the nicest possible way that your language is important and that you'd like your ch child to keep learning and using the language. Don't, uh, don't give up. This is one common, one common process that happens, and this is a huge mistake, is, oh, my child only speaks English to me. Oh, I've started speaking English back. Please don't do that. Even when the child speaks English, make sure you insist on using your language. You can, of course, use some English to explain things or repeat things, you know, if necessary, but really try to use your own language. You have to be consistent and you have to take the long-term view. This could take years and years and years. One of the saddest stories, and I've heard this many, many times, is when adults say to me, you know, my parents really wanted me to teach my language. And I just, you know, when I was about six or seven, I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. And I just stopped. And I really regret it. The number of times I've heard that, it's, you know, and it's something that's completely avoidable. And it's something that, you know, hopefully you'd like your child to avoid. All right. So what you have to do <coughs> is create a need. Uh, for your child to use the language. So think about ways that, you know, it means that your child has to do your uh, use the language, whether it's reading with them, whether it's talking with them, saying, look, if you don't, if you don't say this in my language, I'm not going to reply, etc. But the critical thing is to be positive at all times. All right. This is a positive challenge. It's not something to get upset about. It's not something to get angry about. It's not something that you should punish your children about. It's all about being really positive. In a normal year, what I would say to people, one really good way of getting them to use your language is to take them back to the country where the language is spoken. Uh, in fact, travel in normal circumstances, I don't know when we're going to go back to normal circumstances, but travel in the last few years has never been cheaper. It's actually, it was until COVID, easier than ever to be able to set, to go overseas and spend time in your uh, your country of language and so your children could see directly the importance of speaking your language in a more global context this immersion context is very very powerful now the other thing is to remember you're not alone there are lots of other people uh, like yourselves who who really would like their children to 
learn their language, they grow up speaking their language and becoming multilingual. So you're definitely not alone. This is across lots of different languages. It's also important that in your own community, there's going to be lots of other people like this. And there are strategies you can do to work together. So there are play groups, community groups, etc. Play groups are really good. Make sure that you use the language, um, only that language at the play group, etc. This is a way of showing children that the language is used outside of the home and that it's normal for other children to use your language with, with other people. So it's really, really normal, you know, good way of fostering language. There are community language schools. Please go to the library. Libraries uh, often have very big holdings of books in a wide range of languages. And if they don't have the um, your language, ask them to get copies, um, you know, to, to find them in the system and to borrow them for you. Uh, you know, you'd be amazed what's available. And there's lots of other ways. There's YouTube. Uh, there's lots of cartoons, etc. Depending on the language that your child can watch, there's lot. There's never been easier access to materials to support your child's language learning. But remember, we're all in it together. The benefits are fantastic. Your children will be very grateful to you, as will your parents. The ability to, to maintain language in the family, uh, and the benefits we know come out in um, in the long term. Uh, you know, we know that the kids uh, who grow up in a positive environment bilingually do better at school. That's that's a really important outcome because a lot of parents are anxious about what happens at school. Just remember, you know, it, it, they they might start from behind if they have uh, if they start primary and they haven't had that much English, but they catch up very very quickly. So we know at um, Richmond West Primary School where they have children from ninety nine different schools. Lots of kids from refugee backgrounds, uh, lots of problems that are independent of language. We're dealing with lots of issues. We know that they start behind um, in, in, in English, but very rapidly by grade three, they've caught up. And by year five, they're actually ahead of the average, uh, Australian average. I mean, that is a fantastic outcome. And that's because of the value assigned to language and supporting language. So there are some really good news stories for everyone. All right, if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer them for you. Yes, uh, children who are bilingual are also good at maths. Yeah, they're good at lots of different things. Uh, remember that um, the thing about maths and numbers is that uh, the principles of mathematics are the same across all languages. So if a child is exposed to numbers, concepts of maths in your language, they're able to transfer that expertise and knowledge to um, to other languages, to English as well. So we do know that, that kids do really well in English literacy and numeracy in the longer term. So that's a really positive sign. Sorry, hold on, hold on. Now I've got questions here. I can see it now. Yes, what happens if you have? Sorry, I'm I'm a bit okay. I've got it now. I've worked it out. Yes, absolutely. Mixed mixed language families, perfectly uh, fine. Uh, yes, parents between each other might be speaking English. This is Pedram. Uh, that that's okay. But remember, when you're speaking to the child, to to use your language. That's completely completely normal. There's no problems with that. And yes, Katya is reporting, my partner doesn't speak Russian. My daughter is teaching him. 
That's exactly the kind of thing that, that children do. And the beautiful part about it is what they try and do is show, show adults mastery. That's really important in terms of a child's development. Um, and they will often say, no, dad, don't speak that language. You can't speak it. That's just for me and mum. That's really interesting uh, dynamic. And what they're doing is they're showing ownership. It's really, really quite important. When do they start stopping? It's typically um, during uh, school, early school. Uh, do, they start, do they stop liking other languages? They may go through a period where they don't like it uh, because you know, there's, there's this sort of uh, implicit peer group pressure, depends on the peer group. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't be concerned about that. You just have to be consistent and um, uh, consistent and positive. That's really important. Uh, and in fact, it's a point of pride with my children that um, that they're exposed to Slovenian uh, and a particular language that's so strange it's not widely spoken. And of course, follow your child's interest as well. Remember, there are some things you can bring to your child. But also go with your child where the language language interest takes them. That's really important. Okay, and um, you know tips about where well where parents both parents speak a different second language but don't speak each other's language. Um, well, the first thing is I'd encourage you both to learn the other language. It's it's always a lot of fun. You have a huge advantage if you already have a second language. Research shows that learning a third language is a lot easier because the brain is attuned to learning additional languages. So that's, that's a real positive. Um, and, uh, but you can certainly speak uh, uh, each language to, to your child. It's really, uh, uh, and you, may, you may decide that one language is enough. You may decide that two is okay. In, uh, in the case of my, my family, the reason we focused only on one language, my parents speak related but different languages, was that my mother was spending a lot more time uh, with childcare with, with the children, but also uh, we were going to go back uh, to the village and my mother was determined that the children would be able to communicate um, uh, with, with her family there. So very high motivation. Um, but you know you have to make your own decision about um, what's possible and what's feasible. The other thing that's really important to understand is that in the Australian context, your child's proficiency in English is always going to be better than the proficiency in your language or whatever. That is completely normal and completely expected. Your child is going to finish uh, kindergarten, preschool, will have 13 years of schooling in English, will do at least three or four years of university. There's a lot of exposure to English. Um, while, we, uh, while we want our children to be bilingual, their proficiency or multilingual, their proficiency in the other language or languages, we can't expect them to have um, that level of proficiency and vocabulary simply because they won't have had uh, those many years and thousands of hours of exposure. That's absolutely fine. It's completely normal when you're bilingual and multilingual to have to be better in one better in one language than in another. That's absolutely fine normal. That's completely to be accepted and there's there's nothing wrong with that at all. I hope I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer any more questions that come up in the comment board. So I hope I've, I hope I've encouraged you. There's lots of really simple things that you can do. Uh, in terms of supporting your child's language learning. Um, and they're really positive things as well that actually really foster the relationship between you and your child. It's really important. Okay, is it worth translating conversation? What I would do is that um, I, uh, you, you have to be mindful that you don't want to rely on translation for communication. You have to use English judiciously um, and you may, rather than doing a direct translation, uh, you may uh, you, you may say, "Oh, this word means this. This word is X in um, in English or whatever." Uh, there's a lot of modelling that you can do in your in your own language that will support your child's learning. The important thing is not to rely on English 
uh, you don't have, you know, in the bigger picture, given that they're going to get, a, they're going to spend a lot of time learning English at school, you don't need, you don't really need to support their English language learning. Uh, they, they'll do, they'll generally do very fine. The, the issue is how you can support your language learning. Uh, well, yes, reading and writing is, so do you think reading and writing is important? Uh, I certainly would encourage, remember, those motor skills uh, are transferable. So everything you do in your language will, be, will bring benefit to English in the longer term. Remember, you know, they're, they're playing, they're learning to do things. But I would certainly, you know, you can write your home language, absolutely. And, you know, you can send them to community language schools to support with literacy, etc. Uh, but remember to have reasonable expectations about their reading, reading and writing. It, depend, it will depend on their age. Uh, and, uh, you know, exposure is already a really positive thing. But you, you would support, it's, it, a lot of families, a lot of parents do support their children's reading and writing in the family language. So that's, you know, just have to be patient little by little. And it's all of those skills are, are transferable. One of the great benefits of speaking a language other than English is that many languages have a much better spelling system than English. So in Italian, for instance, or German, or Indonesian, lots of these languages, what you see is what you get. The rules of spelling are very clear. And what that means is that children learn to read and write a lot faster. Learning to read and write in English is, a, is much more of a challenge. I'll give you a very simple example. The letters G-H, they have about six different pronunciations in English. And you have to, how do you teach all of that to a uh, child? Tough, through, cough, hiccup, etc. bow. There's lots of examples of G-H uh, in English. In Italian, GH is always G, and GH always appears before the letter E and the letter I. So your child knows that there is a very simple rule and is able to pick up uh, reading and writing and spelling much more easily uh, in Italian uh, than in English. So if your language is like that, you're actually helping your child's literacy learning because you're providing them with a basis for understanding the relationship between a sound and a letter that they may see or that you have them write. So it's a really positive thing. So Katya says, we practice four languages at home. That's fantastic. Do you have any strategies to keep it up? Ah, well, uh, you know, you're very lucky if there are four languages, um, but actually many families have multiple, multiple languages. So uh, it's, it's not that unusual. Uh, well, uh, it's just a question of, of balancing them all out and what you want to do with them really and whether you want to prioritize uh, any any out of the four. It's really about what you want to do. And the other, I mean, one of the long, there's a really positive long-term benefit of, of teaching language to your children. We know it's great brain gym we know that the effect of being an active bilingual lasts a lifetime. Uh, we know that uh, research shows that being an active bilingual delays the onset of dementia in old age by 4.5 years. It's a fairly consistent finding. That's a huge benefit right at the other end of the life cycle. So that, you know, that's a really good sell to people. For instance, you may have your partner's family members, older members may be hesitant about using a language other than English. You might point out the benefits. It's something that everyone can, can understand. Thank you, everyone. It's been a great pleasure. And uh, I hope you're able to take some of these home things home today and use them positively. And I look forward in the future to meeting you someday and you telling me your wonderful stories about how your children grew up speaking your language or languages. So thank you.